I ask that you turn with me to Psalm number 14. And while you're turning there, you may want to also find and put your finger in the place of Psalm number 53. Psalm number 14, that's page 453. Listen to this. This is God's very word to you. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Now, Psalm number 53, you will recognize, is virtually identical. There are some slight differences, so listen carefully to Psalm 53. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have those who work evil no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon God? They are in great terror where there is no terror, for God scatters the bones of him who, encamp who encamps against you. You put them to shame, for God has rejected them. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion, when God restores the fortunes of let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in your word you reveal yourself to us clearly. And you give us all things that we need for life and for godliness. We ask now that you will open your word to our hearts, cause us to know you and to love you, and to not be fools. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. It doesn't take much to see what the world thinks of Christianity. It doesn't take much, just a little flip through the television, a little reading, a little movie going to see often what the world thinks of Christians. Christians are often thought to be buffoons or foolish or backward or violent even or bigoted. There are those who think that Christians are angry, harsh, and on and on we can go. There are television shows devoted to, at every chance, lampooning Christian thought, and they do other thoughts, but there, there are those who, who take every opportunity to show a belief in God to be foolish. Men rejoice, not necessarily over the things of God, but over the finding of things like the Higgs boson particles. Now, if you all really want to know what that is, you might want to ask Elder Lemon. He's an astrophysicist. But there are men that rejoice in things that they think will put down, that they think will 
demolish any credible belief in God. You young people, if you haven't experienced it yet, you will come under the assault, if not through television, through friends, through people in your life, you will come under the assault for a belief in God, in specifically the God of the Bible. And so, you do not need to be afraid of that assault, and we as believers who live in the world, who have to deal with those who have animosity toward Christ, who do not love the things of God, we have no reason to fear. And in our text, the psalmist, we, we know that this is of David, it says it, he says to us that the foolish atheists may rage, but we can rest confident in our God. And ultimately, we will not be ashamed. Now, we're going to see this in four points. Now, I have to say at the beginning, this outline is not original with me. The main headings are not original with me. I, I keep notebooks. I take copious notes, usually, of sermons that I've heard. But in a notebook, I found the outline that we are going to see. It's not attributed to anyone, but just in case, I'm not plagiarizing. Uh, so, we're, we're going to see from our text four things. We're going to see, firstly, the principle of atheism. And we're going to see the practice of atheism, the problem of atheism, and the prayer for atheism. So how is it that we can rest confidently in our God? Let's look first at the principle of atheism. Verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, that's pretty striking language. We often don't like to call people Fools, but Scripture very plainly and very, very clearly says that the fool, the man who is vile, the man who is base, who does not truly have understanding, is the one who says in his heart, there is no God, or God is not. That is the creed of the atheists. They do not like the idea of God. And this is not so much that they are saying that God does not exist as it is that they are saying God is not for me. I want nothing to do with Him. And the reason that they say such things is because they want to cast off the restraints of God. They do not want His hand upon them. You see, here the atheist is the one who is foolish and vile. The, the name uh, excuse me, the term for atheist is actually a name that you might recognize. Uh, the, the word is Nabal. If you look in 1 Samuel chapter 25, you read of a foolish man. A man named, as we call him, Nabal. He was married to Abigail, and David was kind to this man and did things for him and protected this man's assets. And this man flatly rejected, flatly rejected David's help and did harshly to him. And then Abigail comes out when she sees that David is going to attack because of what has happened. And this is what she says in verse 25 of 1 Samuel chapter 25. And she's speaking to David, let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow, Nabal, for as his name is, so he is. Nabal, or Nabal, is his name, and folly is with him. This is the person who is the fool. Here, the, the psalmist David applies this term to those who say, in their heart, there is no God. You see, what the word indicates is that this person is someone who is perverse and contemptible and vile and what they merely want to do is cast off the restraints of God. The New Testament says it this way, that they suppress the truth 
in unrighteousness. It's not that they don't actually realize that God is. And it's not that they have some proof, some syllogistic proof that God does not exist. It's that they just do not want to answer to this God. And so the fool is the one who, when he looks out at the world, as you will see in just a few Psalms, in Psalm 19, the scripture says very plainly and very clearly that the heavens declare the glory of God. There's nowhere that we can go in this world and escape God saying, I am here, I am powerful, I exist. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the atheist is the one who's seeing this and knowing that because God is and God is powerful and that they are not God, they will have to answer to Him. Is the man who stops up his ears and does not look around and he only thinks of himself. He does not want to answer to God. And so the psalmist says that that man is a fool because he is self-deceived. What's self-deception? Self-deception means that you have to be both deceived and the deceiver. And so for a man to become or claim to be an atheist, he has to say that there is no God contrary to everything that nature screams out to him and contrary to what his own conscience screams out to him and contrary to what Scripture says of him. The atheist, as those are those who have given themselves over to sin. We all know and read Romans chapter 1, and we read it often when we think of the idea of depravity, and we think of what it means that someone has cast off restraint. And in chapter 1 of Romans, beginning at verse 18, it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And then it's going to tell us why. Why is it that they suppress the truth? How do they do it? Well, it says this is why. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God or knew He existed or cannot deny it, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they have become futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And so that is your description of the fool. The fool is the one who looks out at the world and says, this is great and glorious. This world is magnificent. But I don't know how it got here. And I'm not going to say that God is the one who caused it. And so he is foolish and perverse and he stops up his ears and he hardens his heart. Moses uses the same term for the word fool, Nabal, of God's people who do not appreciate the Lord's benefits. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses is preaching one of his final sermons to the people of Israel. And he's speaking of those who will go astray. And he says this, do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not He your Father who created you, who made you, established you? The principle there is that God, He, even though He's in special relationship with Israel, He is the creator of all men, and they cannot rightly deny Him. And so here the fool is the one who seeks to cast off restraint, he doesn't want to answer. He does not wish to be accountable to God. And so he thinks to himself and he tries to convince himself, saying, there is no God. Calvin says of this little portion, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. He's speaking of their, the, the, the portion that says in his heart. He says this, 
Not that they maintain by drawn out arguments or formal syllogisms, as they term them, that there is no God, for to render them so much the more inexcusable, God from time to time causes even the most wicked of men to feel secret pains of conscience, that they may be compelled to acknowledge His majesty and sovereign power. Then he says this, but whatever right knowledge God instills into them, they partly stifle by their malice against Him, and partly corrupt it, until religion in them becomes torpid, and at last dead. They may not plainly deny the existence of a God, but they imagine Him to be shut up in heaven, and divested of His righteousness and power, and this is just to fashion an idol in the room. In other words, men do not like the idea of God. And so they will try to make their own image of God. And they will set it up in their hearts so that they do not have to answer to the God of the Bible. And so we have this principle of atheism. They say that God is not. And they do so foolishly. But then we see the practice of atheism. Look at verse 1, the second half. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. And as we read in Psalm 53, it says that they are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good. Not even one. See, the atheist is the man of Psalm 1. A few weeks ago when we began our study in the Psalms, we said that the, psalm, the first Psalm is the gateway to all the Psalms. And we will see that those men who are there called the wicked and sinners and scoffers are the very men who at this point say there is no God. And Psalm 1 says that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. There is a progression there. And here in chapter 14, we get to the culmination of that progression. They have cast off restraint. They have not wanted God over them. And now they say there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds or abominable iniquities. These are the men who scoff. So the practice of atheism is that it is corrupt. Verse 1 says that, you, you see in verse 1 the total depravity. It says that they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. They say it in their heart, in their very being. They are totally now, total depravity does not mean that men are as bad as they could be. No, God restrains men, and in His common grace, for the good of His church, He holds back men from their iniquity. And so, these men, though they are corrupt in every part, from their heart all the way out to their deeds, they are corrupt and they scoff at the law of God. God is using them ultimately for His glory, for the good of His church. And so we see here that men are corrupt. They do no good. Their works are all abominable. It goes back to Romans chapter 1, that those who do not wish to be under the hand of God seek to cast off His restraint. They, they know Him, but they do not honor Him or give thanks to Him. They become futile in their thinking because God hands them over to their sin. You see, there is a corruption that leads to more corruption. The, the punishment for sin on this earth is more sin. You understand, that's what Romans chapter 1 is telling us that the punishment for sin is more sin, and God 
hands men over to give them what they want. And these men who cast off restraint, who seek to cast off God, God hands them over and they get what they want and they become more and more corrupt. It goes on and says, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. We already know there are none who do good, it says in verse 1. And God says, Are there any that seek? We know the answer to that. We know how the Apostle Paul uses this in Romans chapter 3. He uses this very passage to say that there is none righteous, none who seek after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. They're contemptible. The practice of atheism is that which is contemptible. They are base and vile and they progress in their hatred of God and their approval of others who hate God. You see, not everyone who is a supposed atheist will go as far as he can. Some are restrained by God's hand. But they give approval to those who seek wickedness. Look at our media. How many in our media are those who say, listen, we just need to live and let live, and we need to have equality for all, and we need to define equality how we wish to define it. And so they give approval to every base inclination men. That's what happens here, and the scripture says of these men that they have, in verse 3, become corrupt. The word for corrupt there could mean like sour milk. Milk, when you first get it, is fresh and it's nice. But if you have ever left a carton of milk too long, you know exactly what that stench is in the nostrils. And this is what these men have become in God's sight and in the people of God's sight. They have become corrupt. That is what their practice is. It is like sour milk. Everything that they do is a stench in the sight of God. And so we have here this practice of atheism. It is a, it's a corrupt practice and it's contemptible. And, and further, it's a conceited practice. It says they have no knowledge. All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat up bread and do not call upon the Lord. These are the ones who... They have no knowledge of God outside of his, his general revelation. They are the ones who have stopped up their ears. And so they do not know God as believers do. And they seek everything they can do to destroy God's people. To eat them up as they do bread. To devour them. To take away any hope from them. And they do not call on the name of the Lord. So there is arrogance displayed by them. There, there's nothing, there's no more arrogant person than the person who does not pray. Particularly those who do not pray to our God. Because prayer acknowledges a dependence. When you come to God in prayer, your hands are open. And the atheist is one who does not pray. And so they are arrogant. They do not call upon the Lord. We see the practice, how it is a skewed practice, what they go about and how they do. You see that they are those who do not have knowledge and they hate God with such a passion that they will outcry against all sorts of evils. They will, out, they will cry out against uh, Tibetan monks being persecuted and they will cry out at every small thing, but they will not decry the persecution of Christians in Darfur in any number of places. What they will do is they will look forward to that, just as one looks forward to eating up bread, it says. And so we have the principle of atheism, God he is not, and the practice of atheism, a giving over a casting off restraint, a desire to be shed of God's authority. And then let's look at the problem of atheism. 
they are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. The psalmist here says that the atheist lives in terror. And this is why they live in terror. Remember, they're stopping up their ears and saying, God is not. There is no God. And yet the world is being uh, proclaimed to by Christians, by the church, that God is and He is powerful. And so they know that God is and they know that they will have to answer to Him. They just don't like it. And so they stop up their ears even though they are in terror. It's not a sincere conviction out of which these people speak. I even dare say something like this. There are no atheists. Every single last one of them knows that God exists. They know that He is powerful. And by the proclamation of the gospel, they hear that God is their judge and they will answer to Him. And they know it is the truth because God's Word will convict them even if they do not bow to it. God can at times convict them. As Calvin said, He will from time to time cause even the most wicked of men to feel secret pains of conscience that they may be compelled to acknowledge His majesty and sovereign power. And they know that God is. So they are in terror. And so their foolishness, the, the word fool doesn't speak of a sincere conviction but it's, it's of the man who is in defiance, who even though he knows he's wrong, he's not going to admit it. He's not going to, he's not going to bow to me. Men, you know something of this sort of defiance when your wife says to you, if you're asking her, where is such and such? Your wife says to you, it's in the refrigerator. Well, it's not in the refrigerator. I've looked. I know it's there. I put it there. No, it's not there. And you refuse to take her at this. And she comes along and she pulls it right out. This is the sort of defiance of the atheist. I am here, is what God says. And through the proclamation of the gospel, he says, you are guilty. And they say, no, no, we're not. We're not guilty. You're not there. You're not there. You haven't, you haven't told us clearly enough that, that you're there. But they know deep in their heart. And the psalmist says that they are in great terror. Why? For God is with the generation of the righteous. You see, an atheist, no matter what his tongue says, knows in his heart that there is a God. His heart is a house divided, if you will. In his heart of hearts, he knows that God exists, but on the outside, he wishes to say he does not. But he knows. He knows, especially when after speaking on the things that we saw this morning of Christians, when they present a solid and united front for the faith of the gospel in Philippians chapter 1, the scripture says this to us, beginning in verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Why? For God is with the generation of the righteous. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. The atheist is in terror because ultimately he knows there is the God. And so that's one of the problems with atheism. There's that inconsistency. Now granted, they would not they would not admit this. Some might give way, but ultimately they will not. And then you will see this. There's also an inability on their part. It's infuriating to them. This is 
where we see in verse 5 and 6, they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous to the wicked man. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge, his strong tower, his rampart. There's an infuriating inability on the part of the atheist. You see, the godly man finds refuge in the Lord, and the atheist cannot get into this refuge. He cannot shake the person who is finding his refuge in Christ. He cannot bring down the church. Since the re resurrection of Christ, atheists have been attempting to destroy the claims of the church. He is not risen. He is merely uh, his, his disciples came and stole the body and down through the ages, and yet they are unable to shake it at its foundation because the foundation is Christ. So they have this inability that for thousands of years, biblical Christianity has remained unchanged, and yet the religion of the atheist is the religion of the wind. In the early 1900s, a document came out proclaiming a new era, how men would be able to take care of men and take charge of men and do great things for other men by science and by advancements. This was called the Humanist Manifesto. And a few years later, after the Second World War, and after the First World War even, those humanists had to say, well, wait a second, men are not doing as we said they would. They're not taking part in these great technological advances, and there's still the problem of evil to us, and there's still this man's inhumanity against man, and so they revised it, and we have the second humanist manifesto. And then some years after that, things didn't go according to plan, and these humanists said, well, we just can't get it right. We need to write it out again. And so we have the Humanist man Manifesto number three. And each time there's a progression, just as in this psalm, just as in Psalm 1, there's a progression of men showing their anger and animosity and hatred toward God because they cannot tear down His kingdom is sure, because he is true, and he is the God of the universe. You see, I've told you young people, and you, every one of you, you do not have to fear the atheist. Granted, you must be able to give an account for your faith. You must be able to give an account of the hope that is within you. But even when you are shaken in your core and you don't have an answer, Scripture does. And there are those who can help you find that answer, those who can help you. And you will see time and again as you read the Scripture, those who rage against God's people are those who fall the fastest. And you will see that God's word stands sure through all of the assaults against it. So how do we handle the atheist? It brings us to our final point, the prayer for atheism. Verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. The hope, the answer to atheism is not in your syllogistic savvy. It's not in your airtight logical constructions wherein you can fend off and ward the onslaughts of the atheist. No, the hope for the atheist is not your persuasiveness. It's Christ. And even though there may be a time when you can't answer his oh-so-sophisticated-seeming argument, you can say this, I know 
that God is real. And I know that He speaks to me through His Word. And I know that in my heart, Christ has changed me. He can change you too. You see, the only hope for the atheist isn't your savvy. It is salvation that comes from Zion. And we know that is Christ. That is Christ. And so the psalmist is praying these words, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of His people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad at the resurrection of Christ. We have, we have the restoration of the fortunes of the people of God. We have hope in is resurrection. So the answer to the fool is Christ. Fools may rage. The world will continue to hate Christians. But there is no need to fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. Some will seek to shame your plans. The Lord is to be your refuge. So what is the answer to the fool? It's that salvation has come out of Zion, not out of Hollywood. It's that salvation has come out of Zion and not out of men in lab coats. They can't even agree amongst themselves. So when you are assaulted, when, when you can't answer something, you as well look to Christ. So we have our answer. The fool says there is no God. We say there is Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your goodness to your people. We thank you that in you we have hope. We thank you that you indeed are our refuge. You are our mainstay in assault. We thank you, our God, that you have blessed us. We pray that you will cause us to trust in you, even though the world may assault us. Cause us to rest in our God. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Let us rise together and sing.